algorithms of big tech are designed to give viewers more of what they want to see. And this has made us more divided and polarized as a society. So what should be done to rectify this? And should it be the role of governments or the tech companies to devise the solution? Lydia Khalil, the governments or the tech ch companies? I think regulation lies in the hands of, of government. And I think that the, that question goes at the very heart of it. We have these non-transparent algorithms governing what we see and how we see it. These companies look at these algorithms as if it's commercial property, and they guard it as proprietary information, just like the spices for the KFC fried chicken. But the reality is, is mm. the, these algorithms are actually governing a lot of our information and environment, and we don't have any transparency around, around them. So algorithmic transparency is really critical. It's difficult. It has to be done, you know, smartly. Um, but we have to we have to do it. We can't have non-transparent algorithms, run, uh, you know, ruling what it is, what information that we consume, and how we connect online. Hal Crawford, you were a news director in New Zealand when the Christchurch attacks happened. Mm. So much of those attacks were streamed live on some of the tech platforms mm. like Facebook. But you, along with some of the other news bosses in New Zealand, then made some really big decisions, heavily criticised by some, about how you were going to cover this story. Yeah. I was uh, actually immensely proud of that little chapter. And, of course, it came in the wake of a, a, a horrific crime. What did you decide? Uh, we decided... Uh, good point. We, we decided to... Uh, to cover the trial of the gunman uh, in a certain way. And, and when I say we, I mean all of the news editors of New Zealand, all of the big, uh, the big newsrooms. So uh, I'd never been part of that before. I'd never been part of a very competitive environment where all the news editors get together and decide to do something that was basically decent. Which was what? Which was um, not give the guy publicity, basically. Not um, sort of publicise his hateful ideology. And we were very successful. Um, you know, where, you, where your competitor might delve into his ridiculous manifesto and get all sorts of juicy crap out of it, we decided that we wouldn't do that. And uh, the guy just has faded into obscurity. Uh, you know, he's a hateful individual and, he sh and, he's, and he's not even smart. Um, and with that collective ignoring, we sort of, we, we had a bit of a victory. Are, are you burying the news a bit? Uh, well, that's what we were accused of. Uh, and I thought, no, actually, we're not. We're just doing the right thing. Michelle? And I think whilst I agree there is a role for government and there is a role for industry, there is also a role um, for uh, everyday citizens as well. I mean, you, you specifically ask about um, algorithms, uh, Alice, and you know, how that they are utilised uh, by tech in order to deliver, you know, get more eyeballs, get more clicks, etc. You know, I'm a mum, working mum, with a four-year-old and a nine-year-old that are smarter than I ever was at their age and have more access to technology. I struggle every day with this question, and I'm sure there are millions of Australian um, parents and, and citizens who feel the same way. Knowing how to get that balance between enabling uh, our young people and as they grow to be able to access um, technology and access the internet and access all these applications. But you just look at YouTube, for example. There's an algorithm that determines what video will pop up next and what video will pop up uh, after that. Um, so I think that it is, it is a a role that needs to be played by all parties here, by industry, by government um, and by citizens. They all, we need to be empowered as citizens to make those decisions. We often get it wrong, we get judgement, uh, but at the same time I think that uh, there is a role for everyone um, to play in this. Julie, have tech companies forfeited the right to be trusted on this stuff? I mean, this is ultimately a question about whether they should be deciding the future of these platforms. But given what we've seen today, Facebook in Australia, can we trust them? Yeah, it was more of a face plant by Facebook, <laughs> I think, today. It was a real misfire. But, um, yeah, obfuscation is a huge problem, and I think that's one of the reasons that that the minister wanted to put somebody in this role who had actually been in technology so that I understand the, the dirty rules and the playbook. Um, so I understand what the talking points are going to be. I'll what give are you, the, what I'll, are I'll the dirty you, rules? Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you 
an example of why um, I, I think they, um, we need to hold them to account. Um, I had Facebook executives in, in the office last week, and they said, well, why do you keep criticizing us about um, you know, moving Messenger to end-to-end -end encryption? I said, because I've been asking you for 18 months one question. What are you going to do to ensure that child sexual abuse material is not traded on that platform and that when you flip that switch and it goes dark, you're not just going to go like this? Um, because they, they won't tell me what they are going to do to keep children safe. I give them suggestions. What about homomorphic encryption tools? What about behavioral signals? They won't commit to that. So. They're trying to kick the can down the street so that they can flip the switch and um, it happens and they've been absolved of responsibility. And we've seen just in the six weeks that the e-privacy directive has eliminated um, a company's ability to scan for child sexual abuse images. Facebook said, we're stopping. NECMEC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in the United States, has seen a 50% decrease in the reporting of child sexual abuse images after just six weeks. Lydia Khalil, you've been researching the rise of extremism within the United States uh, and its connection to the tech platforms. Tell us what we don't know yet about this. Well, I mean, no doubt um, the use of social media has increased the scope of radicalization um, because it has increased disinformation on these platforms. It's increased the ability of extremist actors to connect and to organize. It's also increased the, the widespread breadth of exposure to some of these extreme ideologies through these platforms. So social media has played a big role in terms of the growth of extremism. Now, the major tech companies like Facebook, YouTube, have done steps to address this. But like we've been talking about in the program, a lot of it has come too late. For example, we've seen with the QAnon phenomenon, that has taken off because of its activities on social media. And that, that conspiracy has led to real world violence and harm. We saw it with the Capitol siege. They played a big part of that. Now, that was allowed to fester on major social media platforms for years before they decided to shut it down. So we've always seen this delayed reaction that the commissioner was just speaking about, which has been problematic. The other side of this is what's going on outside of the major social media platforms. When, that, when they've been shut out, extremist actors have moved to smaller platforms that are even less regulated. Um, and they uh, you know, go to platforms like Gab, Telegram, where they're able to go unfettered and that's drawn in more extremist actors into those platforms. And so it's a real issue around technology and extremism and the growth of violent radicalization. Right. The can thing I, is, though... Uh, can, yeah. can, can I just pick up on, on a couple of the themes from, from Lydia and Julie and indeed Hal, that these companies have become very powerful very quickly. If you take the instance that Hal was talking about, if uh, television stations... Uh, if anybody even suggested that they would broadcast uh, uh, murder occurring, um, that would have been unthinkable. And part of that is the responsibility and maturity of those businesses. Uh, but you take an action like today, shutting down services which are used to provide vital health information or other information. I mean, one of the things I was thinking about was I worked in the telco sector for a long time. Uh, Michelle has, has worked in the telco sector as well. There's a very strong culture in telco, in telecommunications, that you keep the network up, you connect people. That's your mission. That's your job. And for a company that is supposed to be providing communications, to just turn big parts of the network off today, as Facebook has done, I mean, that would be, I think, unthinkable for telecommunications. Can I, can I take, to take you up on a point there, Minister, around... I mean, if you were in telcos, you know that carriers are not the same as publishers, and carriers are not responsible for the material that they, they carry, otherwise they wouldn't work. And I think we've got a similar problem here. It's very simple to say, oh, they should, ban, they should, should have banned QAnon, they should ban everything. But effectively, they see themselves and we use them as carriers. The utility to us would be much less if they were publishers. So it's not just about two big evil companies called Facebook and Google. It's about us. We, we demand social networks and we demand search. And then we get the crap as well. So 
It's not but simple. They, they market, but they market themselves as, or they portray themselves as neutral platforms, but they're actually not neutral p platforms. They have a certain logic to how they operate, which is engagement. So they will push what drives engagement, and often what drives engagement can be extremist content, can be disinformation, you know, can in, in be fact, things often that... Is, often is, Lydia. I think you, you, exactly. make a, you make a great point, but my point is that they, they can't be publishers, they can't be carriers in the traditional sense, not purely. There's something in between, and this is why we're in uncharted waters.